Hola. Bonjour. Hey, hey. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to D4. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons. We theorycraft about them. We crunch numbers about them. Not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a character, but to explore one potential way to build and play a character in the hopes of creating something that is both really powerful, but also really fun to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D, almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas to help you build a character that you're going to be playing in game soon, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm so glad you're here. So thanks for being here. My name is Colby. Really quick, if you would be interested in getting a step-by-step -step written guide or a cheat sheet to help you recreate this character and any of the other characters that I build on this channel, then I would appreciate it if you would consider joining as a member of the channel. For $2 a month, you get access to the library of write-ups that I create for each and every one of these builds so that you don't have to go back and rewatch the video or take notes. And it's also just a really great way to to help support me and help me create more and better content. Huge shout out and thank you to my channel members. You guys are amazing and I'm so grateful for you. And for everybody else, even if you can't or don't want to join, thanks for being here anyway. Watching, subscribing, liking, commenting, these are all also great ways to support me and the channel. So thanks to you too. So I build a lot of tank characters for this channel. I'd say that tanks or protectors are like my second favorite kind of character to play in really any RPG, next to the agile Gishi characters. There's just something incredibly satisfying for me about channeling my biggest dad energy and keeping my allies as safe as I can, primarily by taking a beating for them, and then largely being able to shrug off said beating. As I often discuss in those character builds though, trying to build a super effective tank can be challenging in that there aren't a lot of mechanics in D&D 5e, and this is a good thing, I think, for the record, that just force an enemy to attack you instead of your allies. The thing that I've tried to do in almost all of my tanks as a result is what I consider to be the next best thing to forcing enemy attacks against my character, and that's strongly encouraging attacks against my character rather than my allies, usually by imposing disadvantage on enemy attacks against anyone other than me which we can do with a few in-game features, mostly found in three different subclasses that I almost always use in each and every one of my tank builds, right? But those soft taunts, as we call them, aren't the only way to encourage enemies to attack us, right? Being super effective in combat is one way, whether because you're doing a ton of damage or providing fantastic support for your team, or maybe just concentrating on a really potent spell that's severely hampering the enemy. Another fantastic way that we've often built characters for, but not necessarily for tanking purposes, is grappling. When you grapple an enemy, you prohibit them from moving, and if you're a good enough grappler and especially if your allies aren't standing next to the enemy you've got grappled, the enemy's best bet might be to just attack you, since escaping your grapple to go attack someone else would use up their action at best, and at worst would cause them to lose their entire turn, futilely trying to escape your clutches. One day I am going to build a grappler whose primary intention is to tank, but not today. But here's something to consider about tanks that I've never really addressed in any tank build I've done to date. What about the enemies who are too far away for you to attack or grapple, or just get up in their business. Say you've got a pretty big battlefield and you're doing your best to engage with as many bad guys as you can and present yourself as the best target for them to be attacking. But sometimes, maybe even most of the time, there's going to be an enemy or two who you just can't get to. They skirt around you and penetrate that back line where the squishy wizard is trying their best to maintain concentration on hypnotic pattern and you just don't have the move speed to get over and help them, especially if you've got an enemy grappled that you'd have to drag with you, right? What is a tanky protector to do in that scenario, huh? Of course, there are limited things you could do, like the compelled dual spell, but I really like my tanks to be able to protect their allies round after round sustainably, and not just with the use of what even if you went straight Paladin, would ultimately be something that you could only use a few times per day in Compelled Duel, right? Unless you are a really high level. So my question is, could we build a character who could apply that 
taunt from range reliably, round after round, maybe engaging with a bad guy or two, but then still landing a disadvantage on attacks against anyone other than you debuff on an enemy on the other side of the battlefield who managed to slip past you, thus ensuring that you do an even better job of protecting all of our allies as best we can, even if they're far away from us. I submit that we can, and that such a character might arguably be a better tank than any other type of protector you could build. And it's what we're going to try to do today. I don't think I have anything else to say. That was a fairly short preamble. I proudly present episode 126. The ranged tank is just a little too boring, so let's go with something a little more evocative. The Psy Guardian. The Psionic Protector. Yeah, I think I like that better. Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for creating this fantastic artwork for this character concept. I send him these each week unless he's out on vacation, and each week he comes back with artwork that just continues to amaze and inspire. If you would be interested in following Randall on social media to check out the other stuff that he's done, or maybe even reach out to him to try and commission him to create something for your character or even your party, I will, as always, put links in the video description on how to do so. Thanks, Randall. Before we jump into the build though, really quick, I want to read to you guys the description for this character concept that the team over at Describe has come up with because they are the sponsor for the video this week. A bestial warrior encased in antlered armor channels shockwaves of fluorescent energy through her clawed feet, launching herself above the maelstrom of the battle below. At the apex of the jump, her civet eyes find her target, an abomination raising a blade over her unconscious ally. Yowling with ancestral rage, she angles her shield sculpting her descent, then tears a hammer from her belt and hurls it at the creature. The impact sends it flying back almost a dozen feet and leaves a crater in its chest. As she falls, the warrior blankets her ally in an opalescent dome of psionic energy. She spatters her remaining foes in charnel muck as she lands in their midst. Then she smiles as she reaches for another hammer. <laughs> oh, that is good. These writers are constantly outdoing themselves over at Describe. So, for those who don't know, Describe is a fantastic tool that players and DMs alike can use to get professionally written descriptions of almost anything you can imagine wanting a description for in a game. Settings, characters, attacks, dialogue, spells, magic items, etc. And if it hasn't already been written, you can request that they create something for you, with a hero subscription at least. But even with a free account, you can get access to thousands and thousands of searchable descriptions in their massive library that is growing every day. And yes, they provide so much more than just box text-like descriptions, including maps that are fully VTT compatible and include descriptions for both the map in general as well as individual places within the map, like the new Stonebridge map that was released recently that has both a summer and a winter version. So awesome. Then of course you've got the new Sonic library that I've been gushing over recently, and that is adding professionally created ambient sound to go along with so many of Describe's amazing scene descriptions. And they've even recently been contributing to third-party content creators, like the work that they've been doing recently for The Vineyard, which is a soon-to-hit Kickstarter compatible across multiple TTRPGs horror fantasy adventure that Describe has been been contributing to. And that's actually something that really warms my heart right now with all of the OGL debacle that's been going on. So much of Describe's content is available for free with just a free account, like I've said. But of course, to get access to all of the descriptions and maps, you will want a hero subscription, which is only a few bucks a month. Even better yet, a celestial subscription if you want access to the Sonic library. Totally worth it, in my opinion, considering all of the Describe goodness that that gets you access to. Go check them out at describe.com slash d4. That's how they'll know I sent you. I will put that link in the video description, of course. And yes, if you decide to purchase a subscription, be sure to use the promo code d4 at checkout and that'll get you 10% off. Big thanks to Describe. You guys are amazing. Also, really quick, before we jump into the build this week, just a couple of housekeeping items. First up, for those who are wondering, yes, even though this week's build is one for D&D 5e, I recorded it actually before my learning to play Pathfinder video that I released last week. I decided to push this one back and try and rush that Pathfinder one out first because it just seemed like an opportune time to do so. But yes, just to reiterate what I've said before, I'm not planning on stopping 
creating content for D&D 5e, especially after the announcement that they made just a few days ago as of this recording about their plans going forward with the OGL 1.0a and the SRD. But I am planning on continuing with Pathfinder character builds as well. I just finished my first script for my first Pathfinder character build, which should be out next week. I'm excited about that. And as far as how much of my future content will be D&D focused versus Pathfinder focused, we'll see. It's going to depend largely on you guys and on how the different videos perform. I'm not interested in creating a second channel. I think that will be bad for YouTube and algorithm purposes. I don't really want to split my audience, though I appreciate that creating some content for one game and some content for another might do a little bit of audience division in and of itself. I hope that most of you will stick around for both. Let me know your opinion in the comments. Right now, I'm thinking that I might go to like an every other week schedule where I'm doing a D&D build every other week and a Pathfinder build every other week, but we'll see, that might change. Thanks for your patience while I figure it out. Okay, sorry for the delay, let's jump into the build. At level one, when we first meet our champion, they hail from a tribe of barbarians. So yes, that is our starting class, but there are some things about this particular hero that makes them unique amongst their tribe. First off, they have an incredible affinity for their ancestors and their own personal spiritual practice or maybe the tribe's practice relies heavily on drawing upon their ancestors to aid them in battle. That in and of itself might not be all that uncommon for barbarians, but for our champion themselves, the connection to their ancestors goes beyond even what is typical for the rest of their tribe. I'm thinking also that one of my ancestors might have been affected by a form of lycanthropy, but it was something more than just a werewolf for a werebear that we have descended from. Instead, I think our ancestor was were-touched by a creature who also had some intense psychic capabilities. Maybe a were-displacer beast? Or perhaps some other homebrew creature of your own. But this very unique ancestor will be affecting our powers when we draw upon them in aid for battle. As for the race that I want to take with this character, I think there are plenty of options mechanically that would make sense for us. I love Loxodons whenever I'm wanting to make a character who will be grappling, as I think this one probably should, or a Thrike Kreen might even be better. Hill Dwarf would be great just for a flat bump to hit points, or maybe Warforged for the AC bump, but I think we get the best of those latter two fantastic defensive bumps by going Shifter, which is what I would take on this character because of the fantastic shifting ability that they get, which tells us that proficiency bonus times per day, as a bonus action, we can assume a more bestial appearance. This change lasts for one minute and grants us temporary hit points equal to two times our proficiency bonus. Also, when we shift, we get another benefit based on a choice we make at character creation from four different options. Long Tooth gives us an unarmed strike bonus, Swift Stride makes us faster. Wild Hunt is a really popular one for barbarians because it prevents attacks being made against us from having advantage and thus negates any penalty we might be getting from reckless attacks, right? Worth considering, especially if you're trying to avoid enemy fire. But as a character who is trying to encourage our enemies to attack us instead of our allies, we actually want them to have advantage against us, so that's a no-go for this build. But then there's the fourth option, which is my favorite, that we will be choosing here, and it's the Beast Hide option, which tells us that we get even more temporary hit points when we use shifting. It's just 1d6, but it's not nothing, as well as a plus one to our armor class. Now, currently, we can only do this twice per day, but that will increase soon enough. And so for most tables on an average campaign day, that should be enough for all or at least most of our combat encounters on a given day. As for ability scores, I assume point by as always and would recommend taking a 15 constitution and taking our plus two there, a 15 strength and our plus one there, and then a 14 dexterity, and then a 10 intelligence as well for this character. You know, I really wish I could get my intelligence higher here. I'm sorely tempted to switch dexterity and intelligence scores, and I'll explain why later but in the end, our survivability is just going to be better with dexterity than with intelligence. And with other important things like dexterity saving throws and initiative, relying on our dex modifier as well, I opted a little begrudgingly to go with 
dexterity over intelligence. I, I just love the idea of playing like a fairly intelligent barbarian. So yeah, if it were me playing this character in game, I just might sacrifice the dexterity. Anyway, in the name of character concept, and it actually wouldn't hurt our survivability as much as you might think. Maybe let me quickly mention, because some of you are probably thinking it, yes, we could have taken Tortle for our race, giving us a decent armor class, even with a dumped dexterity score, but giving up the temporary hit points from Shifter didn't quite make it worth it numbers-wise. Though, if your heart is set on Tortle, or a high intelligence barbarian, it's probably the best route to go, numbers-wise. But yes, we mostly want that plus two to dexterity because barbarians get proficiency in medium armor, so for equipment, I'd go with the gold buy route here and make sure to grab some scale mail, a shield, and then a handful of, surprise, surprise, light hammers, indeed. I think if you're trying to make a ranged attack barbarian, you're going to want to still be using strength for your attacks, though it's not strictly necessary. But that means using thrown weapons instead of regular ranged weapons, since ranged weapons use our dexterity modifier for their plus to hit and damage, and thrown weapons use our strength modifier. Unless, of course, they have the finesse property, like this, or they are a ranged weapon with the thrown property, like this. Anyway, if we're using thrown weapons, the question is, which weapon should we focus on? I like light hammers because even though they only do a d4 of damage and we could get a d6 from, say, hand axes or something, they, unique among thrown weapons, do bludgeoning damage. And that is going to be important for us, as we will see later. And besides, as a tank or protector character, we're not really all that concerned about our damage anyway. Regardless of what weapon we choose, we're not going to be dishing out amazing DPR or anything, right? And we're okay with that. We'll leave big damage to our allies. The only other weapon I think I'd consider going with here, and maybe would rely on for the first few levels of this character, would be the Javelin, as it's the only thrown weapon with a range of 30 feet and a long range of 120. The rest are all 20 feet and then a long range of 60, which isn't particularly far, right? So if you're concerned about distance over damage type, feel free to rely on the Javelin instead. Maybe pack both, just to be safe. All right, as a Barbarian, at level one, we get a couple of features. Unarmored Defense, which tells us that if we're unarmored, our armor class equals our Constitution modifier plus our Dexterity modifier. For us, this would mean an 18 with a shield and while shifted. But if we go scale mail, it's a 19. And, you know, with half plate, which we could get to eventually, it would be a 20. So keep your shirt on, buddy. And then of course we get Rage, which tells us that twice per long rest, for now, as a bonus action, we can enter a state of Ferocious Rage, which gives us a plus two to our melee weapon attacks using strength. That's super lame, and it should totally just be all strength-based attacks, but whatever. See if you can convince your DM to give you that bump, even with thrown weapons. More importantly for us, though, raging means we have resistance to all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, and that's amazing for our survivability, and will do wonders to help keep us alive longer, since the vast majority of damage that we typically take in D&D 5e comes in the form of bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, as I am so fond of reminding everybody. Also, importantly, Raging means we will have advantage on strength checks and saving throws, which means we will be much better grapplers, since grappling requires an athletics check. And yes, that is a strength check, so we would have advantage. And yes, as I've said, I do imagine that our character will be doing a fair bit of grappling in combat. As I mentioned in the preamble, grappling is a really fantastic way to encourage enemies to attack us instead of our allies, since a grappled enemy can't move, right? Thus, as a character whose primary purpose is to take the hit instead of our allies, keeping an enemy close to us is one great way to do that. Now, you certainly wouldn't have to grapple on this character. A big drawback to it is that it would give you disadvantage on your thrown weapon attacks because, yes, when you make a thrown weapon attack, it is considered a ranged attack. And unfortunately, if you make a ranged attack while a hostile creature is within five feet of you, then you have disadvantage on the attack. So, you could certainly try to just stay out of melee on this character, making all of your attacks from range, but I don't know, to me that feels a little bit more like a debuffer character than a tank, right? Like, you're making it harder for your enemies to hit your allies, but you're not necessarily trying to impose yourself between your allies and your enemies, goading the enemy to attack you instead. 
And I mean, hey, if that idea still sounds really fun to you, then go for it and play a kind of a more like ranged debuffer that's sort of trying to kite the enemies away from their allies maybe, as opposed to just get up in their business, right? For the rest of us, we will unfortunately have to suffer disadvantage on those ranged attacks unless we were willing to sacrifice one of our precious feats or ability score increases to pick up the crossbow expert or gunner feat, which both allow us to ignore that pesky disadvantage on ranged attacks with an enemy in your grill thing. And taking one of those feats might feel weird since we're not using crossbows or guns here. There really should be a thrown weapons expert feat that gives us that same ability to ignore disadvantage. Plus like something else, maybe a damage bump, make it a half feet, I don't know, something. Would be worth homebrewing, I think. Anyway, yes, disadvantage on those thrown weapon attacks is painful, but we absolutely could make our thrown weapon attack first, then run up to get up into melee range of other enemies, right? Potentially grappling one of them on that same turn once we have extra attack. And of course, we could even step away from an enemy that's in melee range. Taking an opportunity attack perhaps, yeah, but meh, we're a tank. That doesn't bother us too much. Make our thrown weapon attack against an enemy on the other side of the battlefield, then move back into range of the bad guys to whack on them or grapple them again, etc. Might not be optimal for damage, but again, we're not here for big DPR. At level two, barbarians get danger sense. This gives us advantage on dexterity saving throws against things we can see, like traps and spells, and that's one more reason that I didn't want to dump dexterity here because with a terrible dexterity saving throw, advantage wouldn't actually help us all that much. We get a lot more mileage out of this feature with a moderate dexterity modifier than we would with a terrible one, right? We also get reckless attack. And here's another usually really awesome feature that's slightly less awesome for us because with reckless attack, at the beginning of your turn, you can decide to attack recklessly, which gives you advantage on all of your strength-based melee attacks this turn. Lame. Why can't a barbarian throw something recklessly with all of their might? Anyway, once again, maybe your DM will allow it. Also though, with reckless attack, when you use it, your enemies have advantage on attacks against you until your next turn, as I've kind of mentioned already. Usually that's a downside for most characters, but for us, awesome. You know, I talked about this at length in the Bear Totem Guardian build from a couple of months ago. Giving enemies advantage on attacks against us is a fantastic way to encourage them to attack us, which again is what we want on this character. So yeah, even if our thrown weapons won't have advantage, and man, that would have been a nice way to at least nullify any disadvantage we'd have on our attacks if we were grappling or within melee range of an enemy, right? But I would still want to attack recklessly, both for the advantage it would give me on attacks against my melee enemy. You know, no reason you couldn't make a melee attack with your light hammer or javelin. They are melee weapons after all. They don't have to be thrown. But also, yeah, because it would give my enemies advantage on attacks against me, and for this character, that's a good thing. At level three, we get a third rage per long rest here, and that's super important, meaning that especially now, most of us should be able to rage on most, if not every encounter in a day. But then we also get our primal path, our barbarian subclass. And I think we need to go with ancestral guardian, as I'm sure many of you have guessed by now. So here's the thing. Of the three subclasses in 5e who get a soft taunt on every single attack without spending a lot of additional resources, the Guardian Armorer Artificer and the Cavalier Fighter being the other two, the Ancestral Guardian Barbarian is the only one that it would work for on a ranged attack. The Cavaliers, if they make an attack against anyone other than you, they have disadvantage, Mark, requires that the enemy be within five feet of you for it to work. And the Guardian's soft taunt requires that you make a melee attack against the enemy with your Thunder Gauntlets, right? But Ancestral Guardian Barbarians get the Ancestral Protectors feature. And this simply tells us that while we are raging, the first creature we hit with an attack has disadvantage on attacks against anyone other than us. There's no range distance, and it doesn't have to be a melee attack just an attack. Perfect. Better yet, 
if the enemy you hit decides to attack someone else anyway, even if they hit them with their disadvantage, our ally has resistance to the damage that that enemy is going to be doing. And even though that isn't going to show up on the spreadsheets, when we do our damage report, right? That aspect of this feature should not be overlooked at all. I mean, discouraging your enemies from attacking your allies is great, but cutting any damage they might do in half regardless of whether they attack them or not, that is grade A quality protection right there. And your squishy allies are going to love you for it. But at level four, now that we have got the most important features from Barbarian, yeah, I'm gonna multi-class. You really might not wanna do this. Delaying extra attack for as long as we are now going to be doing is gonna make character levels five through seven a lot more painful on this character. But if you're just trying to do everything in your power to improve the survivability of this character above and beyond all else, like me, because you're a slave to the spreadsheet, then this is the way to go. And in that case, yes, our character now has decided to focus a little more on their martial skill and training, hoping to rely a little less on their pure, unadulterated anger to enhance their efficacy on the battlefield and instead hone their tactics and technique. Whatever your reasons, yes, we are taking fighter levels now. And that means as a fighter one, we get second wind, this is a nice survivability bump for any character, but for one who takes half damage on most enemy attacks and is concerned about taking a licking and keeping on ticking more than anything, it's especially nice. It just tells us that as a bonus action, once per short rest, we can heal for a D10 plus our fighter levels, right? And then, yeah, we also get a fighting style. You might want to go with thrown weapon fighting style for more damage on your thrown weapon attacks, Maybe especially if you can convince your DM that this should let you make thrown weapon attacks without suffering disadvantage if an enemy is within five feet of you or something. Maybe that's where you can piggyback it. On the other hand, you might want to go with Interception. It's a great protector ability that lets us use our reaction to reduce damage for a nearby ally. But like I've said, I don't really care about our damage that much. and we are going to have a fairly reliable use of our reaction shortly. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the defense fighting style here to give us a plus one bump to our armor class. At level five, we would be a fighter two, and that means, yes, we get action surge. This makes me feel slightly less bad for not having extra attack yet, but only slightly, since action surge is only usable once per short rest, and yeah, it gives us a second action when we need it, but hey, Starting off a combat encounter by raging, making a thrown weapon attack to soft taunt one enemy far away, then action surging and running up and grappling a second will be a really great way to start off combat when you've got action surge available at least. At level six, we would be a fighter three, and that means we get our martial archetype, our fighter subclass. And in case you couldn't tell by the title of the video, we are going to take Psy Warrior. Now, I think if you really wanted to focus on being the best grappler you could be, Rune Knight is a better choice here since it lets you grow to large size among other things, meaning you could grapple huge enemies. But for both pure survivability and to help us out with this ranged protector concept that we're going for here, I think Psy Warrior is superior. And frankly, I've only ever used them in a build one other time, and that was the Psy Knife build, which is one of my more popular videos ever, that Soul Knife Rogue mixed with a Psy Warrior. And I've really been itching to use the Psy Warrior in a tank build because they get some really fantastic protector-like features. The first and maybe most important of those is Psionic Power that we get here. This tells us that we get two times our proficiency bonus in Psionic Energy dice, so six of them for now. These dice are D6s, though they'll scale up with more fighter levels. We can also regain one as a bonus action, but only once per short rest, meaning we can have a maximum total of seven dice for a single combat encounter at the moment. 
Right now, we can use those psionic energy dice to fuel one of three cool things. Psionic Strike lets us add a psionic energy die plus our intelligence modifier in damage when we hit an enemy with an attack. Telekinetic Movement lets us spend a die and our action to move either an object or a willing creature within 30 feet of us up to 30 feet in any direction. We can actually do that once per short rest for free without spending a die. And yeah, that can be super useful, especially to get an ally out of harm's way, maybe putting them behind us or something, or even up on a ledge away from attacking melee enemies, right? Super great for both utility and protection. Most powerfully for us though, is the protective field option, which tells us that if we or an ally within 30 feet of us takes damage, doesn't matter where the damage comes from, weapon, spell, etc. We can use our reaction and one of our energy dice to reduce the damage by the number rolled on the die plus our intelligence modifier. And thus, yeah, the main reason I wanted to have a better intelligence modifier. Maybe we'll get there one day. For now, yeah, a d6 of damage absorption isn't particularly amazing. It's worse than the interception fighting style would have been, for sure. But it has two advantages over that interception fighting style. It can be used from range, which is kind of our thing, and it can be used on ourselves. So when I crunch numbers, I'm going to assume that we'll be blowing this on ourselves to increase our own survivability because I'm always trying to explore the limits of what's possible, numbers wise. But I imagine that in game we would be using this more often to help out our friends because protecting our friends is really kind of the point of this character, right? All right, speaking of crunching numbers at level six, it's time for our first damage report. For those of you who are new to the channel or could use a refresher, I'm going to explain how we calculate damage numbers for our tank builds. For everybody else, feel free to skip ahead 90 seconds or so. All right, we pit our tanks against three hypothetical combat encounters of medium difficulty for a party of four at the current level that we're doing a damage report on. One of those combat encounters is supposed to be like a boss fight against a dragon. One is a typical fight against four or five like normal-ish creatures that you might expect to fight at this level. And the third is just a level appropriate fireball. We figure out how much damage our tank would take if they had access to all of their resources, a use of rage, their psionic energy dice, etc., in one single round. That number is our DTPR, damage taken per round. We then determine how long our tank would survive if they took that exact amount of damage every single round, which gives us our rounds to die or RTD. It's a flawed model. You might not have any uses of rage left for every single fight, let alone psionic energy dice to use on every turn. But as I do with all of my builds, I like to calculate numbers based on best case scenario in the interest of exploring what's possible, mechanically speaking, for each character. Also, I mean, every enemy on the battlefield is very unlikely to spend their entire turn just attacking you and only you round after round after round, right? That'd be awesome if they did, but it's pretty unlikely. So yeah, though it may be an imperfect model, it's serviceable so long as we apply it to every tank character we build, which we've done. Right now, with a shield, half plate armor, a plus one to our armor class from shifter, and another plus one from the defense fighting style, and a 14 dexterity, our armor class is a very solid 21. Then, with a 17 constitution, nine and a half temporary hit points on average from shifter, and eight and a half hit points of self-healing from second wind, we are sitting on a max average potential hit points of 80, but we do get to absorb three and a half points of damage on average, potentially, thanks to our protective field. So yeah, I'm gonna assume that we have both our reaction and a psionic energy die available. Keep in mind, of course, that we will have resistance to all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, and that is going to help us immensely versus most attacks. But also don't forget how resistance and damage reduction from things like protective field work together in 5e. First, you reduce the total damage, so you calculate the protective field damage absorption. Then you have what's left if you have resistance, which makes protective field a little bit worse than it would have been if we could have reversed that order, but them's the rules. Finally, I'm assuming that our enemies do have advantage on attacks against us, even though we don't have to attack recklessly. It's gonna make our numbers look worse than they otherwise would, but 
I think it makes us a better tank, so I'm gonna assume we're doing it. All right, the hypothetical boss encounter here is against a young white dragon, and if they did nothing but attack us on their turn, they would on average do 12 damage per round, and at that rate of damage we would survive for seven rounds before keeling over. The typical fight was against four berserkers, and the DTPR there was eight, and the RTD was 11. And then finally against a level three DC 14 fireball, we would take 15 damage per round on average, and at that rate we would survive for six rounds. All right, compared to other tank builds that I've done to date at this level, these numbers put us pretty near the top of tier two for all three theoretical encounters across the board. And that's kind of awesome, considering the additional utility we bring to the table, as well as the fact that we can do a lot of our protecting and taunting from range, which is something that no other tank character I've ever built can do, with consistency at least. Nice. Let's see where we can go from here. At level seven, we would be a fighter four, and that means we get an ability score increase our feet. Now, if I were truly playing this character in game, there's a really good chance that I would take the gunner feet here so that I wouldn't have disadvantage on ranged attacks, even if I were in melee range of or grappling another enemy, right? If I were going to do that, I would probably start with a 13 in my dexterity modifier so I could round it to 14 here since gunner is a half feet that gives plus one to dex. And that might let us nudge our intelligence just a teeny bit higher to boot. Alternatively, I would be really interested in bumping strength so as to increase my chance to hit and grapple. The damage bump I'd get as a result is fine, I guess, but I'm more interested in being a good tank and that means landing my soft taunt attack more reliably and successfully grappling more often as well. But since I'm building this character for survivability and that's what the spreadsheet shows, and I'm sitting on a 17 constitution, I want to take a half feat that lets me bump my constitution by one here. That might also let me help protect my allies while I'm at it. Under that paradigm, I would totally take the crusher feat here. And yeah, this of course is why I wanted to use light hammers. Crusher is the only weapon damage feat, you know, slasher, piercer, that lets us also bump our constitution, but then it also, most importantly, lets us move our enemies when we hit them with bludgeoning damage, right? Once per turn, so long as the enemy is no more than one size larger than us, when we do bludgeoning damage, we can move them five feet in any direction to an unoccupied space. We had a lot of fun with this, especially when we were doing the Battlefield Controller build. That was a hammer thrower also. But there we were moving enemies into the web spell. Here, it's a great way to help our allies in that not only can you potentially give the enemy who's trying to attack them disadvantage on attacks against them, and even if they hit them, resistance to that damage. But now we can also move that enemy away from our ally by five feet and thus let our ally retreat safely on their turn without taking an opportunity attack. Hopefully they'll run behind us, yeah? Just one more little way to help us keep our allies safe and also, of course, bump our own hit points by increasing our constitution to 18. But at level eight, we would be a fighter five, and that means finally we get extra attack. This really is a very important feature to have for this character, not necessarily for the damage, but mostly just to give us another chance to land our soft taunt and or make an attack and like grapple an enemy all in the same turn, right? The extra damage is nice, of course, too. A dead enemy does zero damage, right? You know, I suppose if it were me, actually playing this character in game, I might go fighter five first and then start on the barbarian levels. We'd be delaying our soft taunt going that route and actually our survivability would be worse without the damage resistance from rage, but we'd get to crusher and extra attack sooner. The character just might feel a little bit more viable to play, at least at the early levels. And even without the soft taunt, at least we'd have our protective field and the crusher feet to help keep our allies protected until we did get that soft taunt. I went the route I did because once again, it made the numbers look better. Sue me. Also though, as a Psy Warrior at level five, don't forget that our psionic energy dice get a bump up to a D8 now. That's a, that means a little bit more survivability for us or probably more realistically, more damage absorption for our allies. At level nine, we would be a fighter six and we get another ability score increase or feat. Thank goodness for fighters. Just like pretty much every time I'm gonna take a feat or ability score increase on this character, 
yeah, there's lots of other things that I might want to take, as opposed to what I'm going to tell you to take, which is tough here. It's going to be the best way to improve our own survivability at the moment, giving us an extra two hit points per character level. And again, for those of us raging, that's going to feel more like four hit points per level for most of the damage that we'll be taking. And that's just really hard to bypass. Feel free to take strength or something else if you really want to. All right. For our level 9 damage report, since last check, we have both increased our constitution to 18 and added the tough feat, bringing our total potential maximum hit points if we added second wind and shifter temporary HP to an average of 139. In addition, our psionic energy die is absorbing one more damage when we use it, but of course, maybe most importantly for this character, we've gained that all-important extra attack for a greater likelihood of landing our soft taunt and or grab more consistently and reliably. All right, the boss fight at this level was a young blue dragon, and if they did nothing but attack us on their turn with their claws and their bite, they would on average do 15 damage per round to us, and at that rate, we would survive for 10 rounds before dying. The typical fight was against four hobgoblin captains, and our DTPR there was a 13, and our RTD was 11, and then against a level 5 DC 15 fireball, it would do 19 damage per round to us, and at that rate we'd survive for 8 rounds. And again, we are still hanging out in like the upper end of tier 2 compared to other tank builds I've done to date at this level, across the board for survivability, but with more potential protection capabilities I think than most, if not all of them. And that makes me super duper happy. At level 10, I want to go back to Barbarian for just a second to grab that ability score increase for a feat that's just dangling right there in front of us. So yes, that means we can here, if we wanted, bump our constitution, capping it at 20, which feels great for survivability purposes anyway. We are a serious bag of hit points at the moment. But at level 11, I'm going back to Fighter. This means Fighter 7, and as a Psy Warrior, that means Telekinetic Adept. Basically, this gives us two new ways to spend our psionic energy dice. First up, with Psy Powered Leap. This is a really cool feature. It lets us, with a bonus action, gain a flying speed equal to twice our move speed, but only until the end of our turn. So yeah, it's really more like a big, huge jump. We can do it once per short rest for free though, otherwise it simply costs us a psionic energy die. And that's some really great utility. It won't necessarily be great in combat versus, say, flying enemies or anything, unless you could grapple them in midair. But the other new use for our psionic energy dice here then is telekinetic thrust, which tells us that when we deal damage with our psionic strike, Remember that ability that we got at Psy Warrior 3? Does extra damage on a weapon attack. We can also force them to make a strength saving throw that is unfortunately based on our intelligence modifier. And if they fail, we can knock them prone or move them up to 10 feet. It's a cool ability. Something that now does extra damage and moves or prones an enemy is pretty dang cool. It just wouldn't work all that often for this character thanks to their low intelligence score. One day I'm going to build like a high intelligence intelligence psi warrior, I think. There's some fun stuff that could be done there. Speaking of high intelligence, at level 12, we would be a fighter 8. And that means another ability score increase or feat. And again, especially now that we have our constitution capped and the tough feat, you really should be increasing your strength here, if you haven't already. But an increased strength score doesn't show up on my spreadsheet. We could bump dexterity if we really cared about increasing our survivability against those fireballs, among other things. But I'm gonna go ahead and bump my intelligence here. <laughs> It's going to let us increase the damage absorption from protective field, and it will therefore do more to make our survivability numbers look better than pretty much anything else we could do here. And also, again, it would be fun and cool, and would let us more reliably use telekinetic thrust, or do a little bit more damage if we needed to, with psionic strike. I don't know, I just really want more intelligence, okay? At level 13, we'd be a fighter 9, and we get indomitable, which is probably my least favorite fighter ability in the game. It's not terrible, it's just not great. One time per long rest, 
if you fail a saving throw, you can reroll it. <sighs> I mean, if it just let you automatically succeed, it wouldn't be that crazy powerful, right? Just once per long rest. Or instead of rerolling, maybe let us add like a big bonus to the save, our proficiency bonus or a couple d4 or something, half our fighter level. As is, Indomitable will be pretty good on the saves that we're already good at, like constitution, strength, but not all that great for saves that we're already bad at, like wisdom. Oh well, it's better than nothing. For our level 13 damage report, since last check, we have capped our constitution against our better judgment, perhaps, and pumped our intelligence really against our better judgment. Doesn't feel very intelligent. Uh, for a little more mileage out of our protective field, as well as gained a little utility, we are now sitting at a potential maximum hit point total of 206 on average with protective field absorbing five and a half damage on average when we use it. And thus, against our boss here, which was an adult white dragon, our damage taken per round was 17, and at that rate of damage, it would make our RTD a 13. The typical fight was against five helmed horrors, and the DTPR there was 24, with the RTD being a nine. And against a level seven DC 16 fireball, we would take 24 damage on average, and at that rate, we would survive for nine rounds. And compared to other tank builds that I've done to date at this level, we've actually slipped just a skosh, being more kind of in the middle of tier two. But again, we've still got what I consider to be better tanking skills than most of them, if not all, with an ability to taunt and protect in a much greater area, and that is definitely a huge mark in our favor. All right, at level 14, we would be a fighter 10, and as a Psy Warrior, that means we get the Guarded Mind feature. This ability makes me feel a lot better about not taking Resilient Wisdom as a feat, because it tells us that when we are charmed or frightened, at the beginning of our turn, we can spend a psionic energy die and simply end every effect on ourselves causing either of those conditions. And you know what? That's kind of awesome. It's going to account for the majority of the things that we would need to be making a wisdom save against in the first place. And it doesn't even require our action to do this, so we could break the condition and then just take our turn as normal. What's more, Guarded Mind also gives us resistance to psychic damage. Mm. Too bad we're not a bear totem barbarian, meaning we would have resistance to all damage types now, yeah? That's okay. We're happy with the resistances we have and our ranged soft taunt. At level 15, we would be a fighter 11, and that means we get a third attack per turn when we take the attack action, extra, extra attack. And it's frankly one of the best abilities in game for weapon users. If we cared more about our damage, and had been bumping strength, this would be especially potent. For us, it means a little more damage and more importantly, yet another chance to land our soft taunt. What's more, at Psy Warrior 11, our psionic energy die gets another bump up to a D10 and any bump to our survivability is a welcome one, and of course, this also could increase our damage via psionic strike. At level 16, we would be a fighter 12, and that means another ability score increase our feet, and at risk of beating a dead horse, you should probably do something else, but I'm gonna bump intelligence here to 14. It's fun, and it gives a lift to our survivability as well as the protection we're offering our allies even if increasing our strength might make us a better tank overall. Finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a fighter 13, and that means we get another use per long rest of Indomitable. That kinda sucks, but I'm assuming that we're gonna stick with fighter up through 20, right? And the level 15 Psy Warrior feature, Bulwark of Force, is pretty dang cool and fantastic for a protection-focused character, letting you basically give a psionic force field to multiple party members that counts as half cover for an entire minute and doesn't require your concentration even. That's a plus two to the AC of whoever receives this, so once again, a great way to protect our allies even if you can't convince the enemies to attack you instead of them. All right. For our final damage report, since last check, we have increased the effectiveness of our protective field, but also gotten some other nice benefits to our survivability that don't really show up on the spreadsheet via Guarded Mind, another use of Indomitable. Finally, our damage and likelihood of landing our soft taunt has increased dramatically, 
with extra extra attack to boot. At this point, our max total potential HP on average, including temporary hit points and second wind, would be 264. And though our armor class hasn't changed at all, obviously at this point, you are very likely to have a magic shield and or magic armor. So these numbers are a little bit sandbagged, but against our boss fight here, which is an adult red dragon, they would on average do 23 damage per round to us, and at that rate we would survive for 12 rounds before dying. The typical fight was against 5 earth elementals, and our DTPR there was 45, <laughs> and the RTD was a 6. And then Meteor Swarm, which sucks for every character who doesn't have evasion, we would take 74 damage per round on average, and at that rate we would survive for 4 whole rounds. And that's even with resistance to the half of Meteor Swarm that does bludgeoning damage, right? All right, at this level, compared to other tanks that we've done to date, we've slipped even just a skosh further, putting us kind of in the bottom half of tier two by comparison. So let's talk about what it all means in our final thoughts. The tier score for this character, if you take their rounds to die against all of the combat encounters at every single one of the damage reports and just average it into one big number, is an 8. Putting them near the bottom of tier 2, just barely below that bear totem guardian from a couple of months ago. Alright, what does it mean? Does that mean that this is one of the worst tanks that I've ever built to date? No, not remotely. First up, between our soft taunt and attacking recklessly. We make ourselves about as enticing a target as a tank can be in D&D 5e, outside of the mount and blade, probably, which really did allow the tank to force enemies to attack them, at least if they were made against the character that they were mounted on. Quit it. Assuming that we're grappling an enemy and able to hit enemies far away from us with a ranged taunt, not to mention all the other great things that we're doing to help our allies stay alive, like give them resistance to damage from our taunted target, potentially move that target so our friend can run away safely, and even throw out a protective psionic energy field to help them absorb some damage, etc. I feel like this character has one of the best suites of protective tools of all the tanks that I've ever built. And yeah, the truth is that while being hard to kill is super important for a character who is trying to get hit in lieu of their allies, there kinda comes a point where more survivability just doesn't necessarily make you a better tank, right? I kind of feel like even being on the low end of tier 2 overall, if I were playing this character in game, I would definitely do things like give up some of that survivability to boost my strength score, maybe take the gunner feat at some point, to really make sure that I'm hitting more consistently and harder. I mean, speaking of hitting harder, if you throw in your psionic strike damage, this character could potentially put out some pretty decent damage, especially for a tank character. One thing that I feel like I've got to mention here, for those of you who have the ability to buy or craft magic items with some fairly consistent reliability and kind of choose the magic items that you get, especially if they're just uncommon rarity, I would absolutely prioritize a headband of intellect on this character above almost anything else. It would let us take our intelligence score to a 19 and then yeah spend those latter ability score increases or feats on all the other things that i would like to be spending them on and that would be awesome not to mention having a high intelligence score earlier on would do great things for a lot of our psionic energy dice features but in the end the amount and variety of protection we could bring to the table for our team combined with a little utility some decent damage and a ton of survivability would make this character pretty well-rounded, really powerful, and an absolute blast to play. I think it might become the next tank that I play in the game. So anyway, that's the build for the week, and I hope you really enjoyed it. I had a blast making it. More importantly, I hope you know how much I love you. I really do. Thank you for all that you do for me and for this channel. You're amazing. I hope you'll check out the other content in the channel if you're not typically in the habit of doing so. But more than that, I hope you have a really great day and a fantastic week. And that I see you again soon. But until then, be good and kind and happy. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Let's see here. Oh, what? what is that? 
I got a little wet spot on my shirt. I gotta wait for it to dry before I can start recording. Love will find a way. Darling, love is gonna find a way. Find its way back to you. Love will find a way. So look around, open your eyes. Love is gonna find a way. Love is gonna, love is gonna find a way. Love will find a way. Love's gonna find a way back to you. Yeah. I know. Do 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 do. I know. Bum bum bum. Do 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 do. I know. Bum 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 bum. Do 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 do. I know. Bum 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 bum. Ah, Tesla. An amazing scientist, a pretty cool car, despite what you may or may not think of Elon Musk, <laughs> and a pretty great 80s hair metal band to boot. Still, it's still not dry. <laughs> Come on. Come on, wet spot. Hmm. What if that's like a stain? No, it feels wet. Aren't the only way to encourage allies to attack us. <laughs> I always do that. Why do I always do that? One day I'm going to build like a high intelligence psi warrior, I think. There's some fun stuff that could be done there. Hmm. In fact, I'm going to add that to my to-do list right now. No, don't even say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't even say that. Just cut it out. Should I say that? I don't know. Maybe don't say that. Indomitable. Indomitable, 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 indomitable. <laughs> okay, indomitable. Ooh, it hurts, mama.